Looks like we've got a smallish group, but hopefully it's the best group, right? Hopefully um, you guys are, are here to have a closer look at, at our topic uh, of the next couple of sessions here, looking at predictive analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and, and data science in general. Uh, I look forward to bringing, bringing some of that content here to you over the, over the next couple of sessions. Uh, we're going to kick off, obviously this is in two parts. Uh, we're going to kick off for this uh, first 45 minute uh, session um, where I'll sort of, I'm, take, I'm taking the strategy of, you know, telling you guys about the topic, um, showing you something in, in a demonstration, and then uh, in, the, in the next session here when we come back after break, giving you an example to try, right? So it's the whole sort of learning paradigm of, you know, tell, show, and do, right? So we've We've got uh, some good time here together, uh, I guess an hour and a half all up with the break. Uh, so uh, yeah, I look forward to having you along with me uh, on this topic. Uh, hopefully you guys are going to uh, you know, find this interesting and, and productive as we go. Um, I'm not sure if Sydney's uh, in the room here, but I have one of my colleagues here to, to help us as well, especially in, in the next session when we, when we turn over to, to the, the more, more of the hands-on portion of this. So look, as, as per my introduction, um, my name is Ben. Um, I've really, you know, in, my, in, in a variety of roles uh, throughout my career, I've had the, the privilege of supporting uh, the advanced data analysis community for, uh, for going on 20 plus years now. You can imagine in that time, you know, I've seen a lot of things evolve and a lot of changes uh, to, to the way we approach some of these complex, uh, some of these complex questions, some of these, some of these use cases. And so certainly that's been exciting, right? The evolution of technology, the evolution of computing power, and really what we can bring to bear to address these challenges. But I've also seen a lot stay the same, right, in that period. You know, the use cases where people are interested in applying these advanced analytics really hasn't changed that much, right? I mean, there's some newer, some greater things out there like self-driving cars, right, that are very much in the present. But for, for, the, for the most part, you know, for the rest of us in our sort of day-to-day -day business activities, you know, the applications of advanced analytics really hasn't changed that much, really, throughout, throughout my, my entire career. We've really just been able to leverage, you know, increasingly powerful analytics against that, uh, against those use cases, right? Um, you know, and Y still equals A plus BX, right? It's changed a lot, but uh, at its core, at its fundamentals, it's, uh, it's really the same protocols, right? The same things that we used to call statistics, so what we moved on to called data mining, it's what we call predictive analytics, and now we're referring to these as, as machine learning and, uh, and, and artificial intelligence. So I see no one laughed at my stats joke, y equals a plus bx. Maybe I shouldn't start with that, but uh, never mind, never mind. We'll jump straight into this, shall we? Um, so let's put this into context. I've mentioned a couple of things here already, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And I, I would uh, suggest that if you ask 10 people about what, what the definition of these two things are, you'll get 10 different answers, right? So let me try and put it in some context for what we're going to be talking about today. You know, machine learning and artificial intelligence really live at the top of this ladder, right? After we've established our, our, and collected and organized and established our data, uh, data source and the protocols around our data sources, we're going, going to want to investigate that data and really leverage this, this, this computing power um, uh, against that data. So when we talk about machine learning, uh, the definition here is when we think about machine learning is anything that's really a data-driven process, right? If you're given a use case and you're doing some investigation on it, um, if you, you know, traditionally and, and in, in other disciplines, we'll take a more of a guided approach to that, right? We'll use our experience to build out, you know, analytics and reports and tables uh, and visualizations against that. But, you know, with machine learning, as, we, as the name suggests, we can actually leverage the power of the machine to, to literally take a, a, a data-driven approach to that very same problem, right? To that, to that very same question. As we infuse those results, whether they are the human-driven you know, results or the machine, you know, the data-driven results, when we infuse those into our processes and we infuse those into our operational settings, this is where we start to, to talk about artificial intelligence, right? Whenever you uh, infuse um, some analytics into a decision-making process that's data-driven, you've made that process artificially intelligent, right? Now, it may not just live and breathe on its own. It may supplement your existing practices or protocols or guidelines, but it is, a, um, uh, it is ultimately uh, uh, a process that you've made artificially intelligent. And I'd just like to emphasize that a little bit because, you know, sometimes when we think about AI, right, we think about robots taking over the world, right, or, or um, you know, all these conversations I have with my Uber drivers, right, about what AI is going to do in the future. You know, self-driving cars, you know, comes up all the time and, you know, missions to Mars, right, and all these great big, big projects. Um, 
But even the, the relatively simple projects that you might be engaged on on a day-to-day -day basis, you, those could be artificially intelligent as well. You know, even something as simple as, you know, a process where, you know, all of us might be applying for a loan or a mortgage and we give, we give that lender some data and they, it goes through a, a, a predictive model, right, a machine learning model to, to create some sort of risk score for that provider. In that moment, that process is artificially intelligent, right? A machine driven or machine, a data driven model is actually helping that, uh, that auditor review, review our case. So, yeah, dream big, of course, right? But even these small opportunities, these smaller applications, I would suggest uh, are truly part of what we want to talk about when we talk about artificial intelligence today. So what, what are these, what are these data-driven processes, right? What are these classes of analytics uh, that drive machine learning and, and drive AI? Uh, many of you have probably seen a, a diagram similar to this. The market really likes to break down analytics in, into these subclasses here from, from descriptive to diagnostic to planning, predictive and, and, and prescriptive. Um, if you um, have an existing practice already in, in one of these, uh, one or more of these areas, I would suggest to you that you're already a data scientist, right? So sometimes, you know, when we think about data science or we think about data scientists, we tend to pigeonhole them into maybe the, you know, the, 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 the deep sort of Python programming, AI machine learning uh, practices that are out there. Uh, but all of you today, if, you're, if you have an existing practice in one or more of these areas, you are already working with data and you're already gaining insight from that data, right? As you work forward and as you want to gain more and more insight, you may want to engage you know, other areas around, uh, around this diagram, right? To really supplement what you're, what you're doing already. So I suggest, you know, as we kick off this session here, that if you have a practice, if you are experienced in, in any of these areas or one or more of these areas, you're already a data scientist, right? And you're just looking to build out you know, your skills to really supplement what, you, what you're already doing. You know, I do this with my staff all the time. You know, when we have internal, uh, with my group, when we have internal enablement sessions, I make sure that they all stand up in the room one at a time and raise their hand and say, hi, my name is Ben Chard and I'm a data scientist, right? We have, it's like an AA meeting, right? I mean, we have to admit to it first that we are uh, these, you know, that we're already doing good data science work. We just want to expand our knowledge, right? And ex expand our skills and expand our ability to tackle more and more difficult, more and more complex problems. So data science is really, for me, a much wider definition uh, of what, uh, you know, what, what you might see out there in the market, uh, in the market today. Um, you might also sometimes see this, uh, this diagram here as a cycle or a maturity curve. I don't like looking at it that way, because it's not that one, uh, one area is more mature or, or more, um, uh, you know, or one area has to follow another, right? There's no chronology to this whole sequence. You know, I've seen some great planning applications that have engaged with predictive to do forecasting, and really just those two, those two options working together um, to really build out bigger and better, you know, uh, bigger and better models. I've seen, you know, traditional descriptive analytics um, used for uh, exploratory analysis to help me build better predictive and prescriptive models, and then when I get those results, from these more complex algorithms, these more complex processes, I'm writing them back to a descriptive platform, right, to actually try and describe those or report those findings. Uh, machine learning can play a role here with diagnostic as well. Sometimes we think of that as more of a descriptive type tool, but machine learning can be um, very important here as well when we're trying to do diagnostics. The big difference is with diagnostics is we're not really deploying something into a decision process that we need real-time or live predictions to occur, right, against that, uh, against that data. Sometimes just getting a report on why things are happening is enough, right, and is really critical and really important to, to, to our practice. So as you think about this, you know, think about where you might have experience already, think about where you might be engaged uh, in this diagram uh, within, your, uh, within your work and in your organization, and, and think about the areas that you might be able to expand into. Obviously, for, for our session here today, we're going to zoom in and focus in on, uh, on predictive analytics for you, right? And start to un, you know, pull back the layers on this and show how you can begin to engage you know, with uh, you know, different toolings that are out there. Uh, but even as you start thinking about your, your problems or, the, or, the, or the, um, the projects and use cases you have uh, in, in, in your place, in your setting. So you're all data scientists, so you all should go home after this, or back to your office after this and ask for a raise. So that's the first thing I'm going to ask you to do. The second thing you're going to um, want to think about is then, if, if I'm going to expand into building out some of these machine learning models, you know, how do I go about that, right? How do I expand and, and get better at predictive? 
Um, you know, one of the things, uh, one of the things, well, as I, as I said, you want to look at use cases and identify, um, uh, you know, uh, where the greatest need is, and we'll talk about that. Um, but in so far as technology, you know, so far as tooling goes, you've probably heard of different, you know, techniques and different algorithms that are out there, different libraries of algorithms, you know, C5.0, random trees, for, random forests, neural networks, right? Um, deep learning, I mean, these, these, these great big libraries of algorithms. Um, but typically, you know, when we build out these models, we don't necessarily have to get into a, uh, an, an algorithm or an, or an algorithm challenge, right? What we really care about is, is our goal. And building that model, typically, when you look at tooling and different offerings that are out there, you're going to approach that in, in one of these three ways. Um, sometimes you want, you know, the, be the better data scientists amongst us will actually engage, you know, multiple, multiple options here. But to build out a machine learning model, to build out a predictive model, there's more than one path up the mountain. And there's more than one way to get to that final result that you want to deploy to, 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 to embed some artificial intelligence into your process. Um, on the left-hand side here, you're going to see a lot of emerging technology out there around automated machine learning, auto ML, or auto AI, as it's sometimes, re sometimes referred to. So this not only is a machine learning-based process to, to actually build the model itself, but the entire um, data mining process is automated as well, right? So all the data preparation is automated, all the feature engineering is automated, um, the selection of the actual algorithm itself is, is done really just through a brute force method. It says, let me, let me, just, let me just try one of each and see which one comes out best. Um, and then some post-production and some evaluation on that, on, on the back end. So completely automating that process, uh, it representing the best practices really out there, what, uh, what analysts and statisticians and data scientists are doing today, um, can actually create a viable uh, predictive model for you to deploy it into an operational setting. And this is getting you know, more and more traction today, and there's more and more options out there in, in the auto ML world. And nothing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It doesn't give you a huge amount of flexibility, right, because it's all sort of built into the process. But the, on the complexity scale, it's actually quite an easy approach, right, to building out one of these models. Um, in the center column here, we're going to be talking about uh, guided tools, or, or tools that uh, give you a little bit more flexibility, right, as a user, gives you a, a more of an opportunity to bring your knowledge about the data into the process, to bring the, your knowledge of your business, right, and your mission and your goals into the process. Um, but a lot of the complexity around, you know, the mathematics and the algorithms and all the other processes that are, that are part of this are essentially productized into these, into these uh, guided tools. In a sense, you know, data science or statistical best practices are sort of built into it, right? So you can, you can uh, utilize those, uh, you know, even if you may not have experience, deep experience in some of those areas. And then at the top end of the scale, I mean, to deal with the most complex problems that are out there, um, today we can actually take a programmatic approach um, as well uh, to solving some of these, these really, really complex problems um, that we might be faced with. So this is where we start to engage some of the open source programming languages like Python and, and R uh, and these other, um, uh, other, other languages um, in different platforms and in different tooling and different offerings. Um, obviously, the complexity goes right up to the top end of the scale here because you really are programming this from scratch or integrating other existing code into a process. Um, but it, it gives you really infinite flexibility, really, you know, to handle the most complex problems and to handle, um, you know, we even reach out there far and wide into the weird world, uh, wonderful world of uh, open source, maybe to find that algorithm or that mathematical technique, right, that's going to suit your problem just right. Um, again, all three of these approaches do exactly the same thing. They create a machine learning model which you can evaluate and ultimately deploy into an operational setting if you wish. No one is better or worse than the other. Uh, they just give you different options to handle different levels of complexity. As I said, the best data scientists amongst us will utilize all three. I mean, why not? Right? If they're all doing the same thing, we may as well utilize um, all of these. So as you're thinking about this, you may be, uh, oh, by the way, for the rest of this session and, and for your hands-on lab, we're going to be focusing in on this, on this center column here. So you guys will work through an exercise um, of building out a machine learning model using one of these guided tools, the, the, the option that's available within the IBM Watson Studio platform. Right, so we're going to start you in the middle <laughs> and give you an opportunity as you go forward to explore the other two as needed.
So that's the tooling, you know, a little bit of the language and the science, right? What's out there? Um, how do you might be thinking now? Well, how do I apply that to my world, right? How do I apply that to the, the use cases, right? That I'm working on um, day in and day out. Um, I said there's all these algorithms and libraries. It can get really confusing out there, right? I mean, quite, quite, you know, vast and there's quite a vast variety of number of, of techniques that are available. Um, I'll suggest you, and I'll, I'll go through this here in the next couple of slides, that as you think about your use case, those techniques and those algorithms and those methods that are out there, that big population of methods, uh, will typically for, fall into one of four scenarios. Uh, so let me talk about that. The first one is where your use case or your problem can be defined as a classification uh, and or prediction problem. Right? So you're thinking about your data, you're thinking about your world, and you think about your mission and your use case. And as you look at that historical data that you have access to, there's an outcome. There's a measure. There's something in that that's occurred historically that you want to understand better. Maybe it's a performance issue. Sometimes it's high. Sometimes it's low. Sometimes it's medium. Maybe it's uh, an adverse event. Like this bad thing happens sometimes, but the rest of the time everything's normal. Um, it might be, you know, uh, something more related to um, a, 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 an operational setting. You know, what's this, this machine I'm working on or this vehicle that uh, I'm responsible for? You know, it breaks down every so often. How do I understand when this thing breaks down and when it's, when it's more healthy? So there's this key outcome, right? There's this, this, this key result in your historical data that you want to understand better. You think it's related to the big old bucket of data, everything else that you've measured, right, around, around this world, around your world, and around this use case, but you're not sure what those relationships are, right? This is something we call classification and prediction. And the thing you care about can be a, some sort of category. It could be a score, too, right, something you measure. Um, but this is a classification and prediction problem. So as you think about this, you, you know, your use cases may fall into this general class. And there's lots of algorithms that, that allow you to tackle this problem, but this is typically you know, one of the four that, we, that, we, uh, that we, we initially start to think about. Here's number two and, and three on my list. Uh, the second one at the top here is for those scenarios where you're dealing what, with what we would call more of a segmentation or clustering problem. So as you think about your world and you think about your use case, um, maybe, maybe there isn't that key outcome. Maybe there isn't that, that one measure. That, key performance indicator, right, that's historically in your data. Maybe you're more of a situation where you just got a, a current snapshot of your data. Here's what things look like today, right? Here are my people, here are my transactions, here are my employees, you know, whatever you might be looking at. Here, here are these events, right, and I've got them all measured. Um, really what I'd like to do and take, use some machine learning um, techniques to do is to go in and really find just the naturally occurring groups in that data as they look today. You know, this first transaction, does it, look, does it look like any of the other transactions? Well, yes, if they do, put them together in a group, right? These, these individuals, these customers, these employees, can you put them and put them into groups for me uh, of, of those that, folks that have similar attributes? So you're not really driving, you know, a prediction into an outcome that you care about. You're just looking for those naturally occurring groups, right, in your data. Sometimes, uh, once you've completed this analysis, you want to zoom in and focus in on you know, th those big groups. What are the common patterns, right? I mean, typically, you know, in marketing applications, we look for the larger groups, right? If I'm putting a marketing campaign together, I might you know, have four different marketing strategies, and I want to target four different dominant groups, right, in, in a customer segmentation. So sometimes we're looking for, for, the, for the dominant groups. Um, in other use cases, though, we're looking for the rare groups, the unusual cases, right? The weirdos in that data. You see my little diagram here, you can see you know, some of those little uh, uh, clusters on the crossroads, they've only got like one or two, two points in them, right, on, on the diagram. Well, here are two people or two transactions that are different to everybody else. They didn't really load up on any other cluster. Um, and more interestingly, they're different in a similar way. So sometimes you're looking for the weirdos, right? Sometimes you're looking for the unusual cases, the, the rare cases. Uh, we use this a lot for applications around threat detection and fraud detection and compliance, right? We're looking for who's not falling into compliance with, with, other, uh, with, our, with, with the main uh, protocols that are in, that are in place. Uh, fraudulent behavior, misbehavior, uh, insider threat. You know, these are the types of applications that we really look at uh, uh, focusing in on these, on these rare groups. Again, there's a whole bunch of algorithms that do this. 
Um, but you know, again, we're just aligning our use case with more of a general approach to, to analytics. The third one here on the list is similar to the top one, uh, but we call this uh, association analysis and, and, and link analysis. Um, this is sort of the same idea. You know, we're looking for common groups or we're looking for, for rare, uh, rare combinations. Um, but the data looks a little bit different here. You guys have all heard of like uh, market basket analysis, right? You know, the whole shopping trolley situation where you go to the supermarket. If you buy beer, you also buy diapers, you also buy beer, right? Those, those things that are supermarkets that are analyzing us on every day. You know, your loyalty card. There's a reason <laughs> they ask for some basic demographics on that. They're tracking your shopping behavior and looking at what items you purchase together. So that's the classic example here. But we've used this in other areas as well. I mean, if, if you're thinking about your use case, and you can visualize it as sort of a, a basket of events or items that you want to see how they co-occur. Um, we've used this for fraud detection before. We've looked at uh, uh, transactional data. Um, this was at uh, a, a federal use case that I worked on with uh, CMS uh, for Medi Medicare. And uh, we were looking for fraud in there where we basically aggregated the data to the patient level. And we basically looked, you know, what procedures did they claim, right? That was the shopping basket. Did they get a, a procedure for a broken arm? Yeah. Did they get a procedure for, you know, a, a bad eye or something? You know, whatever those combinations of, of, of medical procedures were, some you'll think would be fairly normal, right? If you break an arm, there's a fairly common combination of procedures, you have a diagnosis, set a cost, right, have a follow-up, a fairly normal shopping basket of procedures that you'd go for. But we found others that were, well, they were either the most unluckiest people in the world, like in this one sh small time frame, they had like 16 broken limbs, open heart surgery, 16 pink eyes, right, well, they, and it was like, well, that's not a very typical shopping basket for a patient, right? Um, obviously, we investigated it further, and it was, it was fraud. I mean, it was a stolen ID, and the bad guys were actually just, it was, it's a scheme called acceleration, where they just flood uh, CMS, Medicare, with claims. Um, all the checks get written um, with this, against this stolen ID. Um, and by the time they figure out that, uh, that they're wrong, the person's have you know, uprooted and they've left, right? So we were able to start to, to tackle that uh, earlier on than normal. So yeah, okay, this is like a supermarket shopping example. We all know the classic story, right? But think about association and link analysis and how it might apply to other applications that you're working on. Um, the fourth general class of analytics, four of four here, is time series and forecasting. This is the oft forgotten one. Everyone likes to think about the other three. Um, a good old time series, a good old forecasting, right? Um, this is, again, its own class of analytic, own set of algorithms, right, that support this. Uh, but ultimately, um, the, the analytics and the data that we're looking at here is a little different to the others. Typically, in a time series type analysis, we, we just really have one measure, like one thing that we're measuring over time. Daily, monthly, weekly, you know, whatever that equal interval of time is, you're measuring that one thing over time. And as you look at it, you want to note the trend, you want to note any seasonality, you want to note any cycle, and any sort of random error, right, in that, uh, uh, in that series. And if you can model that, those four elements, then you can do legitimate forecasting to see, well, what is time plus one going to be? What is time plus two going to be? What is time plus three going to be? What's the next season going to look like um, on this series? So there are algorithms that actually do that sort of decomposition, right, of any series that you give it. Um, and then once they've understood that, they can make the prediction for the next time period. So this is, in my, well, actually, strictly speaking, this is really the, this is truly predictive analytics, right, because it's truly making a prediction into the time plus one uh, time period, uh, in, into the, the future, time plus one. I don't know, you look at this, right, can you see, you think it's got a trend? Would you say this series has a trend to it? Maybe? going up a little bit over time. So we've got some seasonality. This is, this is the months of the year. This is monthly data. So this is summer. This is winter, summer, winter. Uh, and then maybe sort of a larger cycle here, too. You see sort of a wave, a sine wave sort of situation going on in this. A time series or, or forecasting uh, technique will understand all of that pattern there and actually pick the next time period for you. So that's it. I mean, thousands of algorithms again. You know, there's lots of techniques that are out there. 
But as you think about your use cases, they're going to typically fall into one of these four. Right? Whenever I work with my customers, whenever I have that first meeting, I get them to describe their need, their analytical need to me. The first thing I'm doing in my head is trying to you know, align it with one of these four. All right, so now you've built your model. This, this uh, little bit of detail on this slide, I, I, I'm sorry, this isn't as, as a big picture as my other ones. Um, you then have to ask yourself, well, once I've built or completed this analysis, right, built this model, what am I going to do with it? Right? If you can build a model, fine. Look at it and say, that's the most excellent model in the world. Pat yourself on the back, go home, celebrate, have a beer. Um, but then you've got to figure out the next day, right? I'm the only person benefiting from this at the moment because it's my model on my desk, on my work, in my, in my project. How can I deploy it? Or how can I in integrate it into my operational setting? How can I make my operational setting uh, or, or decision-making process in my operational setting truly artificially intelligent, right? How can I supplement it and make it artificially intelligent? You're typically going to be in one of these, these three columns. Sometimes you're just looking for insight. This is more of the diagnostic analytics, right, where you just need insight. There's really no practical reason for deploying this into a, into a real-time sort of scoring scenario or batch scoring scenario. The example I always like to, to think about here with insight is uh, some work I did with the FAA uh, some years ago where we're looking at um, uh, accidents, uh, accident investigations in aviation, right, in commercial, uh, not in commercial aviation, it was uh, outside of commercial. But we were looking at all the characteristics of these accidents, you know, the weather conditions, the type of aircraft, you know, the other elements that were at play. We were looking at sort of maintenance history of the, the, the aircraft themselves, the accident reports, um, and all the data that was coming out of there. And we were trying to understand, you know, what types of accidents really led to more severe injuries. Um, the, the severity of injury we were looking at was death, um, which ones actually resulted in, a, in, a, in someone uh, passing away, somebody dying. Um, so an important, an important line, right? A delineation, of course. Um, we built a, we got a model. Uh, we found some very clear drivers of what led to more severe injuries uh, than other accidents, which were more were relatively uh, benign. Um, but as you think about that that model I created with the FAA, am I going to deploy that in real time? Am I going to put it into the into the air traffic control booth and it's going to be running and scoring aircraft as they're running along the runway? All of a sudden, they get on the radio and go, "Hey, airline two five six, turn left now!" Right? There's no there's no real live scoring that's going to happen there because uh, most of the data actually happens post event anyway after the accident. So it was more really for the FAA to gain insight into the types of accidents, the types of injuries that were occurring, so they could actually build better policy. It's fine. It's diagnostic, right? It's a type of deployment. A report came out. Maybe it was folded into sort of a, a, a BA platform, or maybe it was just a written out report. I mean, who knows, right? It's, it's, but that's a type of deployment. Sometimes, though, you're living in this center column here where you are you know, wanting to embed something in to make a genuine prediction at a genuine point in time. Right? So you're, you're interviewing someone live on the, your bank, you're interviewing someone live, they're applying for a credit card, they give you some information, you type their data in, you go score, are they a good candidate for my credit card, right? The classic scenario. That's a live predictive uh, enab uh, uh, an em embedding of a, uh, of a machine learning model into your process to make it artificially intelligent. <clears throat> but is just getting that prediction enough, right? So if it comes out and says, and uh, the IRS is a great, customer, a great user of this, and all of our tax returns are scored on these sorts of models, as you can probably imagine. But if the model comes back and says, well, Ben, based on his tax return, there's an 80% chance that he owes us more money than he said he did, right? Or let's take a corporate tax return, because maybe you don't care about the individual so much. But this corporation files a sales tax return, um, and there's a 90% chance that this corporation owes us more money or is, is, is committing fraud. Do you just automatically go after that, that company? 90% chance, that's pretty high, right? You probably want to, you might see 90% and go, cool, dude, let's, get, let's get on it, right? Send, send the truck down, right? The, the SWAT team, let's go get them. Um, but when you look at it a little closer, you might note that, yeah, 90% is pretty, pretty high, but 
given the nature of the, the fraud, it's going to take us like six years in court to figure this out. We're going to have to employ like three of our most experienced and specialized auditors because it's someone in the oil industry who's doing offshore oil rigs or something, you know, something really specialized. So you need special, specialized auditors. Um, and then we're going to do all of this stuff. And actually, they only underpaid by $1,000, right? So 90% looks like, oh my god, right? But when you really look at it closely, you go, well, it's going to take all this effort to get a grant. Maybe I don't go after the 90%. Maybe there's a whole bunch of other companies here who are in the sort of 60 to 70% range who owe us like $10,000 each um, and are just sort of, you know, typical maybe sales and retail type companies that aren't going to use any specialist auditors, right? Maybe that's a better batch to go after to maximize me as the taxation authority to get results. That's what we're talking about here in this third column. In the middle, yeah, getting that prediction is cool, right? 80% chance of fraud. But when we really want to align it against our resources, our constraints, and our other processes to get a, an actual recommended action, this is a type of deployment that we call prescriptive analytics. And you saw that on my earlier diagram, right? So yeah, I make the prediction, but please prescribe the next best action based on these other, this other information, these other constraints uh, that I have. All right, let me just do a quick time check here. So for the last, uh, I think I've got about another 10 minutes or so here. Let me, let me switch over to a quick demo. Uh, that's sort of the tell you part of, of, uh, of my, my, session, my presentation. Let me switch over to a quick demo to give you a little preview of what, uh, for those of you who want to stay for the next session and, and do the hands-on portion of this, what you guys will be working on. You're going to be, um, we're going to be looking at, as I said, a guided machine learning tool. So we're, that's our path up the mountain, uh, a guided tool, which gives us some flexibility, um, but does require us to have some data, knowledge of our data and some knowledge of our, our mission. The tooling you're going to be uh, using here is based off of uh, SPSS model, uh, SPSS modeler, uh, the SPSS modeler workbench tool. Um, it supports all phases of, of the data mining process. So as you think about the standard process from data understanding to data preparation to model building to model evaluation, all of those best practices are built in to the workbench for you. Um, and what you're ultimately creating at the end of the day with this is a flow representing uh, the, the, that process, right? Capturing the data, preparing it, and building out a model and, and evaluating it. So you'll see this in your labs um, as you go through. Um, this uh, guided uh, tool, um, as you go through it up here, you'll see some pull-down menus with different um, options, different types of tasks that you can string together in this flow. Um, and these different types of tasks will, will fall into sort of uh, general categories, right? And you'll, you'll see this as you go through your exercise around getting my data, connecting to it, preparing it with record operations and field operations. You'll see a modeling, a, a graphing option to visualize that data to get a, better, a bit of a better understanding of what's going on with it. Um, a whole bunch of algorithms under a modeling uh, menu where you can go and engage uh, with uh, and, and choose some different options. Um, and then ultimately some different outputs and exports that you can do uh, once you've got a result uh, from that analysis. So the operations are organized by these different types. Um, each of these icons or each of these nodes, as you click on them and you view them, there is a sort of a full dialog box system in behind the scenes, right? So you can go in and do some programming, yes, but ultimately we've built in, sort of productized, the, 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 the standard set of choices that an analyst is going to need to make as he or she is working through this, right? And this is all built into the dialog boxes. There are some basic options, and then most of them have an advanced tab. So for the more experienced statistician and analyst, we've opened up a lot of advanced options for them as well. Uh, but for the rest of us who might be just starting with this, you can rest assured that those advanced options are set to what I would call a, an intellectual default, right? What most people set most of the time to get the most reliable results. So you're going to see those, uh, those settings and those dialog boxes as you, uh, as you work through it. Um, again, a typical flow here and this diagram, as you can see this up at the, uh, up at the front here, starts with uh, data sources. So we're going to connect, obviously, to our raw data that we want to analyze. Uh, it'll be one of those four classes, right, that I talked about already. Uh, we want to prepare that data, maybe merge it, maybe do some formatting up front, 
but ultimately a flow ends with these terminal nodes, right? Some things that you're going to do with that data once that model has been created. You'll also see in the demo and in your exercise this golden box here, right? This golden square, this golden icon, this golden node. That's the model, right? That's the, the result of the machine learning, sort of data-driven learning uh, process that you guys are going to actually create and actually complete uh, in your exercise. So again, I'm just sort of orienting you to sort of the basic paradigm here. Uh, that is the, uh, the workbench. If you wish, uh, there are, um, or if you want to study <laughs> or have a cure for insomnia, um, or share with some of your more statistically minded colleagues, or maybe yourself, there's um, an algorithm guide that's published with this, um, which really you know, uh, exposes and, and reports really what's been, what's been productized right under the covers uh, in this guided tool. So no shortage of advanced options. Um, this tooling that you're going to be using here uh, in, in your hands-on exercise isn't a Johnny-come-lately uh, tool. Um, SPSS Modeler has been around for, oh gosh, I'm losing count, probably, I think it's around, tw it's probably 20-plus tw years now. So this isn't something that was just developed, you know, a year ago. Um, so there's a lot of history with this, a lot of best practices over the decades that have been embedded uh, into that process. All right, let's see if my web session here is actually still alive. Looks like it is. All right, so far so good. I let it sit there for a bit, so maybe it went to sleep. Uh, we'll see how we go through this uh, short demo. Um, again, I'll try and finish this, this uh, a really, really short demo. You guys, as I said, um, just giving you a taste test here. Uh, you'll be able to work through your, uh, a, a full-blown example here in the next, uh, in the next session. Um, we're going to be looking at this guided tool in something called IBM Watson Studio. Um, IBM Watson Studio is a, uh, there's an option. Um, it's available in the IBM public cloud, and, and that's what I'm going to be using here and, and what you guys will be utilizing uh, in the lab. Um, there are other options. We have a behind the firewall private cloud uh, version of this, as well as a separate sort of just client standalone uh, uh, tool for, for your laptop as well. Um, but ultimately, at the center of all of these, um, um, uh, all of these different choices, these different uh, options for deployment, um, is this, this idea of a project. And that's really what you're looking at here on the screen now. Um, in a project, I load uh, data assets into this project, so I get these different uh, flat files. If I have database connections I want to make, I can uh, include those database connections here, so I can pull uh, queries from active databases, either in the cloud or on-premise. Um, and then I build out you know, other elements and add them into this project, like these different models here that were created um, from, uh, from, my, from my work. Um, uh, but what we're going to be focusing in, and you'll see this, is this idea of uh, these different modeler flows, all right? as we've been talking about these guided tools. There's an auto AI option in here. Remember the other two columns, right? The auto AI and the programmatic approaches? That all can be, there's other options within this platform to use auto AI. Um, or, and or um, programmatic uh, notebooks like Python and R to build out these models as well. So it's, it's really user's choice, user's preference um, as, they, um, as they work on, on these, these models. Um, let me show you a completed uh, example here. Let's go to this one, build model. Um, so this is one I, I built earlier. This is for um, a simple attrition risk for employees. So I'm looking at a, I'm working for an HR company. Um, I've historically had some folks that have left my, my organization. And historically, I've had some folks that have stayed, right? So I have a historical setting um, of employees. And some have departed and some have not. I really want to understand the difference between those two outcomes, right? I think it might be related to everything else I know about my employees. But I'd like to better understand who and why those people are uh, who, who, uh, who's leaving and why, right, as compared to those that are staying. So in this interface, as you guys work through your, um, work through your lab, you're going to be pulling down these little menus here on the left, which have these different icons where you can pull in. Like, I want to import a data asset. Once, that's the purple blocks. Once I've uh, imported that uh, data asset, I want to do some uh, data preparation to it, right? So maybe select out a subset, maybe take a sample, 
sort it, balance it, etc. There's a lot aggregation. There's a lot available in here. Um, I may want to do some field operations to that. Maybe filter it. Maybe derive a new variable. Right? Do some um, feature engineering, as it's sometimes called. Binning, reclassifying. So plenty of options in here. I won't go through them all. Um, but here are all the different choices that I have for uh, modeling. Um, some of these, for those of you who've, who've looked at this before, these, some of these may be familiar to you uh, by name. Things like C5, uh, shade, random trees, random forest, uh, regression, linear regression, logistic regressions. Then there's a whole uh, support vector machines, et cetera. So you can go and choose some of those specific options if you like. Um, but talking about auto AI, we have these three automatic options as well. Auto classifier, auto numeric, and auto cluster. Remember the, the different scenarios I was talking about? If I'm just pricking in and doing some classification, I can use um, a, the automated option and say, look, I don't know which one to choose. Can you just go through and try all of them for me? And then report back which one's the best. All right. So these more automated approaches uh, are available in here as well. So look, with this example, I'm connecting to this data. Um, here's my employee data, so let me just do a quick uh, preview of this. So much for the quick part. There we go. Um, so typical employee information, right? Income, le length of hire, how much did they travel in their job, position type, all sorts of other stuff I have information about them. The second data set is actually my employees, the last review they had with their boss. So uh, how were they rated right, in their last review? I'm going to merge those two um, data sets together. I'm using employee ID. And I'm going to type that and, and format it. I want to get to this, uh, this, oh, let me show this step here. So here is where, and it's a little cramped on the screen, I apologize, but uh, um, here's where I, all those different fields I've, I've imported, and I set their role in the analysis that I'm going to be doing. So all this information, so the last review, like how enthusiastic was this employer? How could they handle pressure? What's their leadership rating? Uh, communication skills. I'm having these as all as inputs into my model. I think the last review would be a good, good potential predictor, right, of, of whether you leave or not. Um, your, your actually employee ID is not a very good predictor of anything, so I've changed that to record ID. That won't be included in my model. Um, information about how long you've worked for me, how much do you travel in your job, what sort of, what's your position, your education, your age. Um, and then there's this last measure, right, which is an indication. This is historical data, remember. Who attrited, right? Who's attrited? attrited? <laughs> Who separated from my organization? Yes or no? Um, I've made that my target. So I've just changed that role to the target. Now, when I run this C5O model and I connect it to, 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 this, to, the, to the flow here, it knows immediately what it's supposed to be doing, because I've already, I've already set the question. And if I just simply come in here and go run, I mean, I can go in and open it and change some of the advanced settings if I want to, but totally fine just to hit run, you will get this model. And here's the, I mean, it will go through take a machine-based approach, look at all the main effects, interactions, contingencies in that data, check out all the things that are potentially related to these employees separating from your organization, and it comes back with, uh, with these results. Of all the features that you presented as potential uh, good predictors, here were the top, that's about four, about five or six there. The rating you received in your last review <laughs> was a very important predictor of whether you left or not. Eh, makes sense. But we combine that with your age, how much you travel in your job, specifically what your rating was on how diligent of an employee you were, what did your boss say about your diligence, your position type, how proactive you were in your role, what the rating you received around how proactive you were from your, from your last review. These things all in combination are the most important predictors of, of uh, separation or attrition. Well, uh, then it will show some of the top decision rules that it came up with. So based on its analysis, based on its exhaustive analysis of all that data, here's an example of one. I'll just read this off. So if you travel 
um, yeah, if you travel up to 50% of your time, you're in the architect position, you've been in, uh, in your job for more than 3.7 years, um, you're in these age ratings, then the prediction we have for you for attrition, for separation, is yes, if, you've, if you meet that, that criteria, that profile. Um, and we're 92% of sure of that. Uh, because 92% of our historical data, the people who, are, who, who fit this profile, left. So if you look just like this, I'm 92% sure you're going to leave as well. That's how prediction works. All right, I've, I've, gone, I've gone over time here. Let me, uh, let me finish on one, one point, and I'll get you guys to take a break. Uh, where was I? Let me go back here. All right, so that's just against historical data, right? Uh, big deal. I already know who separated. Why are you predicting who I already know who separated? So now we want to score. So that little golden box, right, that nugget, that, that, um, that model I created, now I'm putting it into a new stream here, once it loads, against current data. So here's my employees today who just got uh, their ratings and their, their review with their boss yesterday. Got all this new information. All right, who's going to be most at risk uh, of leaving? So here's my new cases. I've just copied and pasted that same model in. I'm going to run them through it. I'm going to do some sorting and some filtering on them to ultimately create this report. Here they all are. Um, here's employee number 2052. He or she is in sales, and they have an attrition risk of 98.9%. Um, here's someone, uh, employee number 470. Uh, they are a consultant within an organization. Their attrition risk is 0.21, 21%, based on the model, based on historical rates of separation. So now, as an HR department, I can begin to prioritize things like interventions, right? And maybe um, put some policy in place to, to begin to tackle some of these folks that are most at risk, if indeed I do want to retain them. <laughs> On that note, I'll pause, take a breath. They've gone over time. Um, let's take our, our little break here for, for the next little while. And then uh, when we come back, um, I'll hand it over to you. And we'll do some hands-on. Thank you.